Oh, you did what? Oh yeah, very good. So that'll be. We'll, we'll wait. I can't wait to see it. And so we're, today we're going to talk about these other terms that we see in the graphical summary of statistics. You saw skewness and kurtosis in particular, and then there's the Anderson Darling normality test, which I don't know who Anderson and Darling are, but I know about normality. So if it's a Gaussian distribution, then you'd have a high probability for it being normal, normally distributed. So. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta squint one eye and do it. No. Yeah. Let's see, spin the batteries. You ever do that? Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on now. All right, so this is our Anderson Darling normality test up here. So this was some of the data that we showed before. Uh, this was the uh, training, or was it the forensic chemist? It's training. And it, and it looked like they had an outlier at 15. We did the Dixon's uh, Q test, and we did the Grubbs test, and we were able to determine statistically that it was an outlier. And this is from Minitab. This is called the graphical summary. So if you're looking up there uh, in the menu items and you find the graphical summary, this is what you will get. And there's all kinds of values over here that we'll talk about today. So let's look at this normality test. So, and, and so if you're trying to figure out what that was, and I was trying to think, well, what is the Anderson-Darling normality test? I could imagine a normality test. So what did I do? I went to the help menu. And, and I've actually found that Excel, they finally put in, you know, a decent amount of effort into the help menus and they'll talk about the functions and they'll give examples and so on. So I don't know if you use that in PCHEM whenever you're doing Excel, but Excel's help is pretty good and so is Minitab. In fact, Minitab is even better. So if you have a statistical question in Minitab, they have a stat guide and you can go in there and you can read about the statistics. It's, it's like a whole statistics textbook built into the software. So it's a really very good resource. So again, it's common sense, go check out the help. I say it's common sense, but sometimes, you know, you go in software and the software developers have developed the software, but they haven't really spent a lot of time on the help box. You know, and, and you have a question and it, it basically asks you the kind of question of, is it plugged in? You know, not really helpful. Um, you want to know more of the, you know, what you're after, not, yes, it's plugged in. And so then this is the normality test. And the null hypothesis, so anytime you have a p-value, you've got to know what that null hypothesis is. So the null hypothesis is that the data follow a normal distribution. And that would be our, our baseline assumption that the data is just randomly distributed and random distribution is the normal distribution. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is that it does not follow a normal distribution. And so this p-value is the probability that it is a normal distribution. So. You could use, uh, you could force the AD test to do other distributions, but in the graphical summary, just by default, it's a normal distribution. And so let's look at that. If we look at this data here on the left, you can see the histogram, that's the gray blocks, and it's counting up all of the numbers in the bins. And so individual, like the width of those gray, bo gray boxes, those are called bins. Think about, I mean, buckets, right? And so if you measure a measurement and you look at the x-axis and it's divided into 10 buckets, right? This measurement falls in that bucket. And then you measure again, that one goes in this bucket. And so you're filling up the buckets and the height of those bars or those, those uh, gray bars is the number of measurements in each bucket. So that's what a histogram is. It's just dividing the data into bins. And that's really what you're, uh, you can change the shape or not really the shape, but change the look of the histogram by changing the bins. And that's called binning. So if you change the binning of a histogram, you're going to get a little bit different histogram, but the overall shape will be very similar. So this here we see on the left, we have two measurements. Let's see if I can tell. Yeah, you can't really tell, um, but you can kind of see that this, this is the square that you would get if you just had one measurement. So if you come over here, you can kind of divide that line there and there. So it looks like the far left is three measurements. This one's four, so this bin has four measurements in it. These all three, these three have one each. And then this first one has three. Okay, because we only have 10, 10 data values in this. And then we calculate from those a standard deviation and a mean. And then using that mean and standard deviation, uh, Minitab draws a 
a normal distribution on there. So you can look at the histogram and you can look at that blue curve and kind of visually see, does the histogram look like a normal distribution? It really doesn't. It's weighted heavily on the left side with some single measurements on the right. And so that's not very normal. And the Anderson-Darling normality test gives us a probability that it's normal. And if you look up there, it's 0 0.017. So there's a 1.7% chance that this is normally distributed. Anything below 5%, we would, re, you know, we would reject that null hypothesis. So since this is less than 5%, we would, we would reject the null hypothesis that this is normally distributed. Okay. Uh, it doesn't really mean the data is bad, though. It just means it's not normally distributed. Okay. So since we only did 10 measurements, we don't have a real nice uh, confidence that our standard deviation is telling us what the the true random variation in our data is. So it just kind of brings a little bit of a question on our standard deviation. Uh, it might be higher than the normal, it might be lower than normal. So we don't exactly know exactly what our standard deviation is. Um, we can calculate it, but because it's not normally distributed, we might not be able to call it sigma, or we can call it s. Okay. And we only have 10 values, so that makes sense as well. So that's a little bit of the normality and uh, you know the, the analysis of, uh, of our data, looking at it from a normal perspective, whether it's normal or not. Now that further down, we have the mean, the standard deviation, and the variance. You know how to calculate those. You can do those even by hand. Uh, but check yourself, if you would, to make sure you know how to do that with your calculator, because it really does save some time. If you can put in the three values or five values, uh, or even 10 values and use the statistical tools on your calculator, it's only going to make you better. Okay? But check yourself against Excel. Like type in, if you want to do it for 10 numbers, type all those 10 numbers in there and calculate the mean, the standard deviation and everything, and then do it on your calculator and make sure you're getting the same values. That way you know and you have confidence in yourself. So let's scroll down here. We get to these values, kurtosis and skewness. So we're looking at the trainee data set and it has a kurtosis of three. And we don't know what that value is, so what would we do? We would go to the mini tab, help menu, type in kurtosis, and we would get the entry. And so this is kurtosis. So the kurtosis value um, is how peaked the data is. And in terms of positive or negative, this is how I remember it, a positive kurtosis. If you, if you think about um, the very center of the peak, if it's higher than you expect, then it's a positive kurtosis value. <coughs> Think about that. If it's higher than you expect, then it's a positive kurtosis value. So what do I mean by higher than you expect? So I'm walking along the data, and notice that I'm coming up here, and I get to the middle of the data, and it's like, whoa, what the heck just happened? <laughs> and then it's back down on a gradual slope. So because the middle is higher than I expect, then, uh, then it's a positive kurtosis value. One thing that this shows is I might have two distributions, right? I've got a short, broad distribution, and I've got a narrow, um, tall distribution. And so this kurtosis value can hint that I've got a symmetric data set, but I might have two different uh, groups inside that data set. So let's say I've got a large seizure of cocaine, I'm doing my sampling plan, and I think that I'm, I've, I've got all one homogeneous group of samples. And I go and I grab my random samples, and I do my, you know, it's 100 of them, so I do 28, and I go in and I analyze those. And I get this kind of shape to my distribution, and it raises questions of whether my assumption that this all 100 packets are the same. That, that assumption may be failing here. I might have seven or eight packets that are very um, um, well constructed and, and very low standard deviation, and then I've got a bunch of other packets that have a wide standard deviation. So maybe two different batches in that large seizure of 100. And since they have the same average, they're on top of each other, but the standard deviation is different. You see that? You can have two different things go different. You can have the average shift left or right, or you can have the standard deviation shift. And this would be a sample, an example where the standard, standard deviation has shifted. Okay. So that's when our middle point is, is higher than we expect. That would be a positive kurtosis. 
And what about this flat peaked data? This would be uh, when the middle is lower than I expect. So I'm, I'm climbing this steep hill and I'm expecting to have kind of a Gaussian shape and I'm like, wait, where'd the top go? The top's much lower than I thought it would be. So it went up early and then it was flat at the top and then it went down. <laughs> And since it was flat at the top, that's a negative kurtosis value. So the top, the, the center of the data is not as high as I expected it to be. This also can show perhaps a symmetric multimodal data. So, um, so if I have a, a Gaussian peak here that's pretty tall but fairly narrow, and then one in the middle that may be about the same size or maybe even a little lower, and then another one here that's a little bit taller. If I add all those together, I'm going to have a pretty flat top. And this middle one's a little lower than I thought it would be. And so that gives me that flat top. So even though the data is symmetric, I don't see a shift to the left or the right. That's what skewness is going to tell us. But the kurtosis value tells us you've got a symmetric data set, but there's something going on. You've got, you've got uh, differences in standard deviation, or you've got overlapping overlapping data sets or overlapping populations inside your larger group. Questions on this? Does it raise any concerns? Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Let's look at skewness value. So here's our trainee data. It's uh, skewed 1.13, which is not very much, okay. And here's our forensic chemist data, skewed 1.3. So quite a bit more. So look at this data. You notice how uh, it's, you know, most of the data points are on the left and then it trails out to the right. And so whichever way it tails, that's the, that's the sign on the skewness. So this is an example here. If it's a positive skew, it's skewed to high values. So these, these are high and low. So this would be high and low numbers. Okay, so generic. Numbers on the x-axis, I have high numbers on the right, low numbers on the left. And so if it's tailing to the high numbers, that's a positive skew. If it's tailing towards the low numbers, then that's a negative skew. It's easy to mess this up. If you look at it, you say, well, where's the weight? You know, it, up at the top one, it's heavy on the left, it's heavy on the low numbers, but you're getting it wrong. Where does the tail go? So the tail goes to the high numbers, therefore it's a positive skew. And the bottom one is the tail goes to the lower numbers, therefore it's a negative skew. And look, to, look online. You can find these different histograms online, and you can look to see. Uh, the top one is almost always what a salary curve looks like for, for industry. Because if you look at this and you say, hey, this is salaries... And you have number of workers, okay? And then right here is probably the, the, the average, the mean, okay? I drew a little mu there. And then this is going to be the median. The median, and then, you know, you've got the upper, you know, executives and so on. You've got very few people making really high salaries, and then you've got the average salary for the company, and then you've got the hourly workers and the almost hourly and the lower salaried workers all down here. So there's a bunch of people down here. So whenever they talk about average salaries, that's not the correct number to use. Like if you're going to look for a job and, they, and you look in the you know, internet and you say, okay, the average salary for this position is X, you really want to look at median. Because median is more likely. So because salary data is always <coughs> skewed to the right, always skewed to the high, um, you always want to look at median salaries. And if you're hearing somebody reporting the mean salaries or the average salaries, they've made a choice to do that. And it's probably because it's more favorable to the point they're making. Okay, So you always ask yourself, when someone presents the average, why they didn't use the median? And, and if somebody presents, presents the median, why didn't they use the average? And for salaries, you always want to show the median because it's always skewed. Okay, so then the, let's come on and look. 
Now there's other things that you can have a zero skewness value, but but uh, skew is just whether the data is symmetric or not. Okay. And so in both of these cases, you would have a, a, a skewness of, of, of zero, but there's symmetric data. So here, um, this is a normal distributed data. It's beautiful, okay? It's about the same on the left and the right. So zero skew values, but here, this is symmetrical as well, zero skewness, but this would be bimodal data. So we would have a distribution on the right and a distribution on the left. And if the right and the left have the same number of measurements, the skew value would be zero, okay? But the um, data is certainly not normally distributed. So skewness and normal distribution are totally different things, totally different measures. That's why we have skewness, because you can have normally distributed data, or you can have not normally distributed data, and then the skewness value comes in and says, is it symmetric, left or right? And the kurtosis would come in and say, is it peaked in the middle or not? So these are all different things that can go wrong with your data, or different ways to characterize your data. Because you can't give somebody 28 numbers, you know, you've got 100 packets, you're going to analyze 28 of those, and you're, going to, you're not going to give them 28 numbers. You want to give them the mean and the standard deviation. And then these, you might say, and the data was a little bit skewed, it was 1.1, not much, okay? But, you know, it was normally distributed, so we think we've characterized the standard deviation well, and we understand the population. Or these values can tell you, maybe there's something else there, maybe it's bimodal. So, so those are the things that you want to, you want to look at. So let's compare this now to um, like a lower specification limit. So let's say in our uh, in our trainee and forensic chemist data set that the limit of quantitation was ten percent. Now that's a kind of a crummy limit of quantitation. Ten percent cocaine, like you're. Your, what I found in your car ought to have at least 10% in it or I can't say it's bad, right? Um, we've got two problems there. Either we have a, a very unsensitive uh, instrument or insensitive instrument or there's just cocaine on everything, <laughs> right? And so just the background level of cocaine is so high that uh, it's really, we can't convict you unless it's a greater than 10%, you know, so... Um, that you laugh, that 10% is pretty high, but that's actually the case for money. There's so much cocaine and heroin and so on residue uh, on our money that uh, you could detect it on just about any, any money. And so they used to say, if you were you know, caught at the airport with a bag of cash um, and they swiped it and it had drugs on it, that then you were a drug dealer. I mean, you could get brought up for, for drug charges and you know transportation of money it's still illegal to transport more than ten thousand dollars in cash you know like if you're at the airport and the, the money dog smells your bag and you have ten thousand or more dollars in your bag you're going to get questioned why are you carrying this much money okay uh, but it's now been shown in court now you can't be convicted for anything related to drugs just because there's drugs on the money because there's drugs on everybody's money it's kind of sad so if you ever get the uh, ion mobility spectrometer out in forensic science, um, get them to swipe your money because it will ding every time. Yeah. We had a guy, uh, he got some new bills from, he said, there's a new uh, 7-Eleven or something in New Waverly. And he said, I'm sure. He said, I got some crisp $20 bills. He said, let's see. And then we wiped and it was a high hit for cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's like, I had never heard a high hit. So it, it has a hit and then it has a high hit. So this was, so we were all laughing about that. So, uh, so this, what I'm trying to say is the 10% limit of quantitation is probably not that realistic, but I wanted to show you this capability analysis tool. Okay. So let's say our limit of quantitation was 10% cocaine. And our, we were trying to test our forensic chemist and our trainee by giving them a 13.2. Remember, that was the, that was the uh, expected or true value for that sample. And our trainee was kind of all over the place uh, in, their, in their analysis. So we can take that trainee data and run what's called a capability analysis where we have to put in a lower spec. So we'll say the, the, the method that the trainee was using has a limited quantitation of 10 
percent cocaine and here's the trainee data how often on a sample that was truly 13 percent would they say it wasn't it was below the limit of quantitation so basically a false negative right so it was definitely 13.2 percent cocaine and they mistakenly because of their analysis said it was less than 10. that's a false negative okay and so this is the capability analysis and it's a mini tab tool you put in the data put in the spec and run it so you don't have to build this yourself and here's what we have we have the, the trainees data set the target was 13.2 that was our, our known value and here was our lower specification limit and you can see that the uh, the normal distribution curve comes and it hits that value and so down here this little red box is the overall performance in parts per million less than the lower specification value so that's 970, 970 parts per million. Nine zero, 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 zero. Okay. And so what we can do is we can just get rid of two of these places. We're going to get rid of the 70 and we're going to get rid of that. In fact, if I were to round that, that 9 would become a 10, wouldn't it? So I'm going to scratch that out and put a 1 there. Does everybody follow what I just did? I just made my my top number one significant figure by rounding and so I'm losing I lose three place values and I end up with one in a thousand that's not a great false negative rate so if the sample was 13.2 my trainees variability would give this person a false negative one out of every thousand chances so they may do a thousand samples you know, if this was urine tests and we were doing colorimetric things and they're loading up the tray and their technique was poor, uh, you know, out of a thousand, there'd be a false negative on average. Okay, so that's not great. Uh, false negative is, in terms of forensics, um, probably more acceptable than a false positive. Okay, to be honest, um, because we don't want to wrongfully convict somebody. Okay, so this is not great. Um, and so let's, uh, let's look at this one now, the capability analysis of the forensic chemist. Same target value, 13.2, tighter standard deviation. Same spec limit, 10%. So now, if you look at this, this is the, the forensic chemist data, and way down here is our, our lower spec limit. So now you can really see the difference between the... the um, the actual performance, the expected capabilities, and that's why this is called a capability analysis. If given a sample of 13.2, which is pretty close to 10, our trainee is kind of iffy. They're starting to get, you know, a 0.1% chance of being wrong. But our forensic chemist, such a tight uh, analysis technique that now it's less than, well, it says zero parts per million below the lower specification limit. You know, let's look at that point zero, 0, It's never going to be really zero. We know that. But it's only reported to two decimal places. So if this were a, if this were a 4, that would make sense, right? If it were a 5, you'd round up to 1. And so we can at least say it's less than point zero, zero 0.005, or it would have rounded up. And so now we have point zero, zero 0.005. I would say less than, right? 0 0.005 parts per million. So that's their, their false uh, negative rate. It's less than 0 0.005 divided by a million. Let's move our decimal places around. So let's, let's move this decimal place three to the right. Okay. So that's five parts per billion. That's pretty good. That, that analysis person will probably never do, you know, a billion of these samples of 13.2s. We're getting that close to uh, 10 is the lower specification limit. So this again, is capability analysis is a great tool. You can look at the, the mean and standard deviations all day. <clears throat> and you can say that the, you know, the forensic, the, the training needs some training, needs more training, okay? 
Um, but this is really where the rubber hits the road. When am I going to be wrong? When is it going to cause a problem? Okay. Uh, if, the, if the lower specification limit wasn't 10, but something like 0.1, then the training may be okay. So it depends upon your specification limit too. That, that standard deviation for the trainee, we look at it compared to the forensic chemist and we go, oh man, that really stinks, it's terrible. But if you look at your lower spec limit, when is the trainee gonna actually be wrong? If that lower spec limit is really low, then they may be okay. But if that spec limit is high, or if you want the trainee to operate pretty close to the specification limit, then you might, you might have an issue. Like if we set a, a capability, we say we don't want a false error rate more than 1% of the time. It's pretty ridiculous, but we could, scoot that, we could scoot that forensic chemist way down here and say they could analyze samples that were 10.5 with their narrow thing and still have a false negative rate less than 1%. But the trainee, we'd have to scoot those samples up above 13 for them to meet that same specification. So knowing the standard deviation tells you how close you can operate to your limits and it widens your operational window. So those are very good things. And so this, I really am I'm sort of promoting this capability analysis so that you can understand how close you can operate to your limits and still uh, not give bad results. <clears throat> okay, let's do the Kahoot and see if uh, everybody can run in. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody still trying to do? All right, here we go. <clears throat> so look at the distribution in the side. So see that distribution of income up there? It's normally distributed. It's exhibiting negative kurtosis, skewed to the right, the high values skewed to the left, low values. Okay, so whoever's hanging up. Yay! Gets out. I like it when they get 100%. <clears throat> I'll just grab one off of uh, <laughs> Google Images. Otterhound deaths. This is the data. So. <laughs> What's that? Oh, did they swap around? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to mess with you. All right. Now, there are really two, two uh, correct answers on this one. Yes, it's skewed to the low values, but it's also bimodal. See this little hump? That tells you there's another distribution buried in there. And so you really have two means. You have the, the main body of data that's skewed to the right, or in this case, skewed to the low values. And then you have this other little, little jump. And so this says age at death. So you got some sort of, you know, zero to five years where there's, once they get past that, then they have a good chance of living to 12 years. So long life for those dogs. Very few live to be 15. Now you know. <laughs> I don't know what an otter hound is. I could Google it. So, this is talking about the forensic chemist's data it was not normally distributed, so their work should be suspect. Ah, good. 
So yes, their work shouldn't be suspect. It just means we may not have characterized that, that distribution. So assuming we know the population distribution, the this, this sigma, the population <coughs> standard deviation, uh, is a shaky assumption. Okay. If, it's, if we haven't captured sort of the normal distribution, then uh, our assumptions on sigma are a little weak. U.S. spending on space correlates with suicide by hanging. This is from that Tyler Vegan site of spurious correlations. And so we looked at this a few days ago. And uh, it, you can see the data there. It most definitely correlates. And yay for the three that said, so what? <laughs> yes, it's correlated as, so what? Because why? Correlation is not causation. So just because something correlates doesn't mean that there's one causing the other. Okay. Okay, great. Very nice. There's our, our bronze, our silver, da, 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 and gold. Spotlight. Okay, very good. Oh, I just used the gold silver. You did what? I just noticed the gold silver bronze. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, hmm. <laughs> right. Okay, so let's look at these advanced statistical tools. Where we get into multivariate statistics. So. So as it says, multivariate, that sounds like multivariable, and you're right, it's multivariable statistics. We have uh, more than one variable that we can collect on a sample. And this can be color and so on. So, you know, if you've got a, a seizure of suspected, you know, some suspected drug or controlled substance, you're going to write down everything. You're going to write down the color, the texture, how it was packaged, and all of that. All of those are variables. And so it's all information. Particle size, rarely do they do particle size, but that's another option. You can look at it and say fine particles or rough, you know, coarse particles, uh, needles. So all of those things are, are observations, and they can be used to classify and characterize the, the data. And so one of those things is concentration. So we're going to be dealing with complex substances. It's not going to be a pure lab sample like we give you in organic where it's one substance. It's going to be a mixture. And when we get into the, the drugs part, we'll talk about the components of those mixtures. But today, we'll talk about three of them. We'll talk about cocaine, procaine, and caffeine. So a lot of times, people can pull cocaine out, because that's the expensive piece, and dump in nodos, and you know, add in caffeine. So it masks the absence of the cocaine. And you stretch your profits, OK, because you're spreading out your product. and, and but if you go too far with that, then yours isn't as potent as the dude around the block. And so, you know, eventually it's going to cut in because people are going to go elsewhere. So this is some of the market behind all these drug preps. And so we'll see some of that. Today we have in this set, uh, we've got a huge seizure of drugs. And the bags were, you know, in three different groups. We don't know, you know, if those groups are from the same batch or not. But we have essentially three seizures. And we labeled them A, B, and C. So this set of bags was labeled A, then this group was B, and that group was C. Are all three the same? Were they from the same uh, batch, or were they different in some way? So that's what the investigators want to know. And so each, each seizure has 10 packs of white powder. Uh, because it's less than 20, we're going to test all of them. We have 30 total, but they were, they were grouped. And so since they were grouped, we're going to treat it as three different groups. And we're going to test all 10 in each group instead of testing 20 of them and then one more. <laughs> OK, so we could in 30, we could test 21 and save some time and save some money. But the investigator said, no, these are three distinct groups. So let's treat them as three different different groupings in, seizure, in the seizure. So. Um, 
Could they be the same source? Could be they be related in some way? These are some of the questions that they were asking. So here's the data, and they were labeled, the bags were labeled like A1, A2, A3, A4. So we had 10 in each group. So uh, what we want to do, though, is we want the software to be able to understand that all the A's are related. And if you label them A1 and put that into the software that way, it doesn't know that A1 and A2 are both A's. Okay, you can look at that and say, oh, I could group this very easily by A, but for the software, you've got to actually put those in separate columns. So that's an important skill called the blocking, blocking the data. So we want to be able to group the data by A, B, and C. And if you leave the number next to the letter in the column, the software is not going to be able to do that. So look what I've done over here. I've taken it over on the right. I put seizure A, and then down there it changes to B, and down below it changes to C. And then I have pack 1 through 10. And then in the B block, I have pack 1 through 10. And in the C block, I have pack 1 through 10. Now, the software could use this same information and block it by pack and say all the pack 1s are together and all the pack 2s are together. And you could block the data that way, but it really wouldn't make sense because it's pretty random whether this one was pack A1 or that one was pack A1. So there probably isn't anything to be gained by blocking it by pack number but you could, you could make the software do that. And then it would have pack one for A, B, and C, and pack two for A, B, and C, and pack three for A, B, and C. But because the groupings were A, B, and C, that's what we're gonna block the data by. So we're gonna block it by group A, group B, and group C, and then we're gonna look to see if they're the same or different. And it's actually pretty easy. That's the question we're asking, same or different. And if they're different, how are they different? It, you can't ask the question, how are they different, if they're not different. <laughs> so you got to answer the first one <laughs> first. Are they different? If so, then how? <clears throat> and so this case ID is just split up. That's why uh, basically in text what I just said. And another way to, to say blocking is called grouping. So we're grouping the data, but statistically I learned it as blocking the data. You're not trying to block anything. It's just putting it in a block of numbers. Okay, so this is a tool, a very useful tool in Minitab called the 3D scatter plot. And since we have, <clears throat> if you'll notice the analysis here, we have an analysis of cocaine, procaine, and caffeine. So we, you know, labeled our packs, we labeled our vials, we put them on the sample tray, ran all 30, and we got the analysis from our chromatograph of the amount of cocaine, the amount of procaine, and the amount of caffeine in each. So each pack has three different chemicals in it that we analyzed. So we have all of those listed in this table as well. And here's the data, the scatter plot of the data. And so looking at this, uh, I have over here on the right how you get there from Minitab. So this is the menu command, graph, menu, 3D scatter plot. Um, and you, you can have it as a simple scatter plot, which just plots all of the data, or you can do it by groups. And so I said definitely do it by groups. And so it's uh, grouped it by seizure. Uh, case ID, so the group A, B, and C, and that's what gives us our three different colors. And so I'm saying 3D scatter plot the data, but color code it. Color code A, color code B, color code C, so that we can see if they're different. Now look at the data and tell me the answer. Are they the same or are they different? And someone who's brave. Yeah, yeah, there's a weird one out there by yeah, itself. Which might just be... But B and C seem mixed, mixed, all mixed yeah. together. Yeah. And so you're pretty sure A is, A is unique. It looks like A is unique. And so just from one plot, we can say, yeah, it looks like A is different than B and C. And that would be a good conclusion. Okay. Can you see anything about correlation? So the way correlation works is if one axis goes up, another axis goes down. It's a little difficult to see in this plot, but we'll see it later in different plots. But so, yeah, definitely A looks different than B and C, and there might be a correlation there. So when the cocaine goes up, the other values go down. But we'll look at that. It's really hard to see in this particular view. Yes? Is it problematic that the procaine um, has a different scaling than the cocaine? So it goes up by, by the same um, You know, it's... Um, it can be, 
okay? But I would say it's not a problem unless it's orders of magnitude different, you know, like, um, you know, three different decimal places away. Um, but even then, there's really no problem in analyzing the data. Um, it does come up, though. I'm trying to remember from my stats training when that becomes a problem. And uh, it doesn't become a problem just looking at the data, for sure. Yeah. It, it might be the correlation coefficients, where you're actually trying to see how they're correlated. With, but I, again, I'd have to look that up. But since it is scaled that way, it kind of helps you see how they are grouped. Yeah, it does spread things out when there's a small difference in the data. So now let's look at the box plot. So again, this is the same data set, and we're just using different tools to look at it. So it's like a survey. Let's say you didn't have the 3D scatter plot, but you had a box plot. Someone gave it to you. Could you come up with the same conclusions? Okay. So now try to mentally forget about the scatter plot. Okay. And I'm giving you the box plot. So this is the same data grouped by A, B, and C across the bottom, and then subgrouped by the three different drugs. So you see farthest down, A, B, C, those are your main groupings. And then the next layer up are the three subgroups. And then you have the data box plots above that. Can you come to the same conclusion that A is unique? How? What are you seeing that, that tells you A is unique? There's super high cocaine concentration. Or like it has higher like percentage than the other two. Yeah, so cocaine is unique in A. Uniquely high, okay, in A. Another thing in this box plot, because we have three, we can, I mean, I guess you can do it with two, but notice this pattern here for, the, for B and C. It's the same, it's this pattern here, which is the same pattern here. And this has a pattern like that. So it's a different pattern, so it's unique. So you're just looking at the patterns, you say, wow, look, let's connect the means and see what the shape of the, the groupings are. And the, the, the grouping on the left, uh, the different drugs, is a different pattern than the ones on the right. And so, uh, so that tells you that A is unique. Okay? So that's one of the conclusions. It looks like A is different from B and C. And you can get that from the box plot, and you can get it from the 3D scatter plot. Okay. Either way. And then let's look at correlation. Oh, well... Um, Okay, well, well, we'll look at correlation here, but then we'll come back to the box plot and see if we can see correlation. Okay, correlation, I think, is a little more difficult to pull out of a box plot, but we'll see it. This here is a very interesting thing. This is called the matrix plot of correlations. So these things can get really complicated. We have three variables, um, and so it's going to be a three-by-three three matrix. It's going to be every variable plotted against every other variable. Okay, can you imagine the tediousness of doing this in Excel? So you've got all your columns, and you've got all your different groups. And so you're taking the cocaine column and plotting it by the procaine column, and the cocaine by the caffeine, and the procaine by the caffeine. And then the other options too. Caffeine's the x-axis now, and cocaine's the y-axis. And caffeine's the x, and procaine's the y. So it's every possible combination looking for correlations. So looking at this, now when I have caffeine plotted by caffeine, it's just a linear line because it's the same data. And so that's down the diagonal, you see these linear relationships because it's cocaine plotted versus cocaine. See down here, cocaine here, and cocaine here. So this top data is just the cocaine column plotted by, against the cocaine column. But even then, you can look at that and say, well, look, in cocaine, A is different than B and C. So even though it's just a linear relationship, you can still say all the high values are A and all the low values are B and C. So there's a conclusion right away that, that it looks like A is different than B and C. You know, if, if we use every tool possible and we get the same result, that's pretty good. <laughs> right? So a scatter plot tells us A is different. Box plot tells us A is different. The correlation plot tells us A is different. So A really is different than B and C. And then here we see some correlations. So at least in cocaine and procaine, uh, when, when the cocaine high is high, the procaine is low. Okay. And, and uh, see, here's, here's the lowest value for the procaine. 
And so when cocaine is high, I'm in the low values of propane. And then when co cocaine is, is low, I'm in the high values of the propane. So that's a negative correlation. It's noisy, right? The data's not on a straight line, but it looks like there's a correlation. Now that might be fuzzy to you. You look at the data and you say, well, I don't really see that correlation. But um, if you see the data in the corners of the boxes, there's a correlation. Because that's, if it's in the upper right corner and the lower left corner, then you've got a correlation. It's just a lot of scatter, but then that tells you later on to do a statistical analysis where you actually get the correlation coefficient. You actually get the number and the <coughs> key value. Right here, it's pretty scattered. So you'd have to kind of wave your hands and say, looks like a correlation. But if you actually do the correlation analysis, you'll get a p-value. You'll get a probability that there's no correlation. Okay. So let's go back to the box plot and look at those correlations. Uh, well, actually, this is the numbers. So if you wanted to actually get some numbers on this correlation, let's do the correlation matrix. So if you go to the statistics menu, basic statistics correlation, the dot 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 means it's going to spawn a, a, a dialog box and it's going to, you want it to display the p-values. The null hypothesis is that there's no correlation. And the p-value is the probability that that's true. So here are the results that we get. That's the menu, the dialog box that you do. And these are the results. And this is in one of the practice tests and this will definitely be on the exam. Being able to interpret this little um, triangular matrix of correlations. So here we have the procaine-cocaine correlation that we saw in that, that chart. It was a negative correlation, meaning when cocaine went up, the procaine went down. Okay, And this is the p-value, the probability that there's no correlation. And it's 0 0.003, which is less than 0 0.05. So we could reject that null hypothesis and we could say it appears that there is a correlation between these two. What's interesting is that this also picked up another correlation that we didn't see. It's not a strong correlation, but there is a correlation between uh, cocaine and caffeine of a positive 0.5. And here's our p-value, 0 0.005. So even though we didn't really see that in the chart, the numbers bear it out that there's a, there's a um, correlation between cocaine and caffeine. And what about procaine and caffeine? There's, you can always calculate a correlation coefficient, but that's why we need the p-values. Just because you have a correlation coefficient doesn't mean it's statistically reliable or st significant. And here's the probability that there's no correlation. 83% probability there's no correlation. Okay. So we're going, to ex uh, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis in that situation. Okay. And those are all three of the possible combinations. This is a good time to ask questions if you're not 100% confident on this. Yes? So are we going to be given the data set or just the distribution? Just, I'm saying you'll be, for this particular type of question, I'll just give you these, these numbers and say this is a table of Pearson correlation coefficients and their p-values. You know, which one of these is correlated? So we're not going to have to, like, make any box plots or anything on the test? Mm -mm. Okay. Interpreting them. Like if I give you a box plot or a dendrogram, which is coming up, you know, you can, you have to interpret them. Yeah. <coughs> and so here, here's where I was. I knew I had a picture of the box plot with the correlations on it. So finally I got to where I was aiming. And so look, if, if cocaine goes down, you see over on the left, cocaine is high. Uh, and here now cocaine has gone down and the, the procaine values have gone up. You see that? That's the negative correlation. Cocaine went down and procaine went in the opposite direction. And there, that's that upper left correlation coefficient. And then this is saying that cocaine and caffeine are positively correlated, meaning they both go down together. And so here, the caffeine has dropped. I didn't see that because these look very similar. But on average, it's saying that these two are, are lower when the cocaine is lower. So I wouldn't have pulled that out, but statistically, it's a, you know, it's a significant correlation. Okay. 
two values going to row five. So sometimes you can't pull stuff out of the plots because it's not as obvious, but statistically it's, it's buried in there somewhere. So there's a place for the plots to get the really obvious stuff. And then you go into the statistics and actually get the p-values to tell you uh, the things that are hidden in the data that you just didn't notice. Okay. Now we'll take a different analysis. This is a very useful uh, tool when you have more than three values because we could plot the scatter plot I mean and show all three values all together but if you have four then you've got a problem because there's you can only plot three axes you can do color codes I guess but um, you know when you have a, a large complex data set sometimes uh, this clustering will help you pull out patterns in the data and so this is uh, called the Euclidean distance, which you've, you've done in algebra. You know, it's the difference in x squared, the difference in y squared, the difference in z squared, all added together, take the square root. That's the distance between two points in three-dimensional space. But there's really no limit to the number of dimensions. It could be, you know, u and v and t and so on. You could have essentially an infinite number of coordinates and you just take the differences and square all of those, add them together, and that's the Euclidean distance between two points in a multi-dimensional space. Okay. And it's great for computers. <laughs> they don't care, all right? And so this would be, you know, the cocaine value minus the cocaine value squared, and the procaine value minus the procaine value squared, and the, and the uh, caffeine value minus the caffeine value squared. Add all those uh, squared differences up, take the square root, and that's the difference between those two data points. And if they're really close together, then they'll be a small distance. And if they're really far apart, they'll be a big distance. And so then we plot all of those. Um, and so what this is doing, if we draw then a circle around the closest two data points, this is what we're doing with the clustering. So if we take this, this data points up here in the upper left, and we find the distances between all the possibilities, and we say that two and three are closest together, we're going to combine them. So from here to here, we've combined two and three. And now we calculate the midpoint between those. And we recalculate all our distances. And so quite obviously, one is going to be closest to the midpoint of two and three. So we calculate this distance here. We calculate that distance there, that distance there, also that distance, and one to five, and one to four, and so on. And we see that this, this is going to be the next closest grouping, and so we combine that one. And so now 1, 2, and 3 are combined. And so then we recalculate all our distances from the midpoint of this one. And so we have this distance here, this distance there, that distance there. And now 4 and 5 are close. And so we combine 4 and 5. And then we just have this last distance between this midpoint and that midpoint. And then we have all the data grouped together. Now, we then plot this in what's called a dendrogram. It's a kind of dendrites are little, you know, divisions like a like your hand. It's got five dendrites. Okay, so it's got a central piece and then it's broken into five pieces. And so this plot kind of looks like a hand coming down. It's divided into parts. And so let's look at this dendrogram. So this is our data that we just had, the, 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 all three groupings of 10 seizures, and this is the dendrogram for that. Now, on the y-axis is the distance between the clusters. And so if these two data points are joined early on, like B6 and C8, this, if I take this value and come all the way across, that value right there is the distance between B6 and C8. So it comes up and then we draw a bar at the distance between B6 and C8. These two data points, bag C8 and bag B6, were almost identical. Okay. And so we're drawing the, the, we're comparing all of the numbers and we're saying, wow, those two values had almost the same result for cocaine, procaine, and caffeine. And we draw a little bar across, and then we say, all right, let's treat them as one group 
and compare recompute all the distances. What what next bag was most similar to this grouping? And so then we come over here. Actually, before we get to that, when we find another grouping that's very similar, um, we have B6 and C8. Well, here we have B8 and C6 is probably the next one. And this over here is their distance. So they were that close together. And then B2 and B7 were really close together. And so notice all of these combinations are between B's and C's. Where's my A's? All over here. Notice how none of the A's are mixed in with the B's and C's. So here's another way to learn that A is unique and B and C are, are pretty much the same. Some people love this, some people hate it. That's fine. It's just another statistical tool. I just wanted you to, to see a dendrogram and be able to understand it. So what kind of questions would I ask you about this? Looking at the x-axis and all the different you know, packets, you should be able to tell me which two are the most similar. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? These two are the most similar right here because they, pro they connect first. So B6 and C8 connect first. You should be able to answer that. That's obvious. Okay. You got that? Okay. And then looking at this, you always come up here. This is everything combined. And then you come down where it breaks into two groups. And so this, you draw a line between those two groups. And you see what's on either side of that line. And what do you see on the left side of that line? Mostly A's. Okay. Is there any exceptions? No. All the A's are on the left side of that line. So this is two groups, A and not A. <laughs> okay. Over here, you've got, now that splits in and you've got that one unique sample, B1. Remember on the scatter plot that, that one off by itself, that was B1. And then everything else was all mixed together. Okay. So I wouldn't call B1 a unique group, but you may have, you know, let's say there was a, a big cluster here of, of values and, and, uh, and then you had this split over here with a big cluster of values. You might have three groups in your dendrogram, you might have two. And that's the most difficult judgment call to make. Okay. Uh, this is really two groups with a B1, a unique uh, packet. Okay. So I would say this is two groups of data, A and not A, B and C. <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions on this? This is, again, it, it's a way, you could do this analysis with five chemicals or 12 chemicals. It doesn't matter. It's a two-dimensional plot that can capture the differences in data that that is uh, got many more dimensions than you could plot. So that's why a dendrogram is nice, is that there's no limit on the number of, of parameters that can be fed into it, and yet you still get a two-dimensional plot. And you're just trying to find similarities and differences. Okay. Keep moving on. So there's the first one, then you've got the next one. Next one, so I kind of walk through it. And so now let's look at the control charting. We already started our control charting. Um, we've, uh, what, how many data points do you have to this point? Roughly? Seven or eight. Okay, so we've still got another week and a half or so. Um, so we're collecting data. At this point, we're, we're analyzing our process. We're getting familiar with the variability in the data. So we're really not charting yet. Uh, but. But again, uh, I've talked about this a little bit before, and it's in the, the purposes of that. You've already written that up in terms of the, the goals of this assignment, and that is to look at data-driven versus calendar-driven action. And so this is what we're talking about with pull. So Kanban is a Japanese word for sign or banner, and, and so we want our instruments to raise a sign when they need help. So that's what a control chart is. You're looking at it over time and it'll, it'll go out of control and that's the Kanban, that's the sign that something needs to happen as opposed to putting it on the calendar and introducing variability when you don't need to. And so here's Minitab, it will do control charting for you. So all of this stuff that you've been doing in Excel, if you, if you downloaded the, uh, 
the mini tab, you know, free trial or whatever, and you want to do your, your control chart in mini tab, hey, that's awesome. You know, uh, go for it. It'll be fun. Um, so here's all of the tools and the statistical tests you can use for calling it out of control. We're using plus or minus two sigma. Okay, uh, that's, that's only one possible way that it could go out of control. Okay, this will test for changes in your standard deviation. And so it's expecting to see a certain number of data points get close to the limit, like at least one or like in the uh, watch limits, it's expecting 40% roughly of the data to be outside that, that plus or minus one sigma. If that's not happening, then your sigma's wrong. Who was it that said they were uh, collecting data and then there was some outliers uh, already? Um, it had to do with the markets. Oh, it was the, 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 the virus, the coronavirus. Like right now, during your training period, if you're, if you're stock, if you're collecting stock and it's, it's going crazy during your training period because of the coronavirus, and then, you know, once we start control charting, everything settles down, then you're probably going to have a standard deviation problem. So it's varying greatly now and later it won't. Many tabs control charting tools would catch that. Okay. Whereas our just plus or minus two sigma would not catch that. Now you can set up all of these tests and it'll be out of control all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a, let me just read some of these. One point greater than K standard deviations from the center line. That's the test we're using and you can define K as two. So for our test, plus or minus two standard deviations from the center line would be our definition of out of control. So that's the first test in many tab. But here's one, K points in a row so when I say K, I mean this column, you get to set that variable. So this is saying nine points in a row on one side of the center line. So that's going to catch a trend in your data. So you're going along and it's low nine days in a row. <laughs> it's not outside the watch limit. It's not outside the, the action limits, but it's starting to trend a little bit. And so you can really tighten things down using these control charting tools. Uh, here's one. Uh, six points in a row, all increasing or decreasing. So maybe you started below the center line and you're moving along and six days in a row it climbed. Okay, so you could pick that trend up. And maybe six is not enough. Maybe you want to put 12, whatever. And you just want to catch any trending. If there's trending up or trending down, you can set it here. Uh, here's a weird one, 14 points in a row alternating up and down. So. A day that's high, a day that's low. A day that's high, that's for 14 days it did this unbroken pattern, up and down, up and down. That's not right. <laughs> so you're looking for some kind of noise, something that might cause that. That might be the tool that your process is susceptible to. And so you would pick it. Here's one. Um, two out of one point greater than two standard deviations from the center line on the same side. So uh, again, it's more... Uh, higher low values. <clears throat> but down here, uh, 15 points within one standard deviation of the center line. So that's also not normally distributed. So 15 points within the, the watch limits. So you go three weeks and nothing even gets outside the watch limit. This would catch that. So you could put all of these in Excel with if-then statements. And that would be fun, but I'm not asking you to do that. But you could, you know, and you could go back to the notes and look at all of these and, and make all kinds of little tests. And, and you would see how many times you had to take action. So, you know, the first time somebody learns this in the lab, they turn them all on, and then they wear themselves out because they're constantly fiddling with the instrument. And it's actually making things worse because the more they fiddle with the industry, the more it swings back and forth because you are a source of uncertainty, all your little techniques. Okay, but anyway, what you would want to do is know your process and say, you know, we're really, really susceptible to trending and we don't want that. So we'll just tighten the screws on the trending test. And if it trends at all, then we're going to shut it down. <clears throat> but the data is telling you what to do, not the calendar. That's the key. And so here's an example of this control chart and it's, it's showing you that you were out of control and, and uh, before you even went outside the uh, action limit. And so number seven, you can look at those tests 
and you could see that number seven was 15 points within one standard deviation of the center line. So we had not gone outside the action limit, but that's telling us take action because your standard deviation is, um, <clears throat> is wrong. Okay, so this, uh, this is the output that you would get from Minitab if you had uh, if you had an error, it would show a red point and would give you a number. And then you go to this thing called the session log and see what that error message means. And so this is what you would see in the session log. Okay. So this is pretty cool. You just have your data, you type in your new number, redo your control chart, and if everything's cool, all your points are um, shown like that. Uh, if you get some red points and some numbers, then you go and see what those numbers are and then you go do your research. And then we have principal component analysis, which again is, I think, probably the most confusing one. And this has to do with trying to find uh, trends in the data that are not obvious. The ones that we had with our three seizures were obvious. A was different than the other two. Okay. Um, but you could take all your data, put it in, and what it does is it tries to take the three axes that you have and reduce them to two so that you can plot it. Well, this. We can plot three axes, but what if we had four? That would be a real problem. So you could take four and reduce it to two, and then you could plot it very easily. So it's really necessary when you have four or more variables, and you take the principal components of those variables and plot them on a two-dimensional space. So this is what you get. You can take the factors, you, put, you reduce the data. Basically, you're creating two trend lines. Uh, you're saying uh, there's a linear relationship of cocaine, procaine, and caffeine that would be good for the x-axis and a different linear relationship that would be good for the y-axis and it's going to spread the data out as far as possible. Everybody want to repeat that? We're taking our three variables and we're creating a linear relationship. And these are the coefficients. So this is the equation for that linear relationship. I'm taking 92% of the cocaine value I'm subtracting 68% of the procaine value and adding in 66% of the caffeine value. So I have three coefficients of my values. And that's my line for the x-axis. And then for the y-axis, I have almost nothing from the cocaine value. 68% of the procaine value and 70% of the caffeine value. And that's going to be plotted on my y-axis. And this is going to spread out the data and I'm going to capture 90% of the variability. I'm going to make that, I'm going to get 90% of the variability spread out on this chart. And so this is what we see when we do that. And it essentially looks like that same correlation matrix. But this has really spread it out even a little further and gotten group A as far away from group B and C as it can get. So if the data was all mixed in, uh, this would have pulled it apart even further. That's about all I can say about principal component analysis, is it gets really complicated. And so if you were uh, tempted to do this, if you were analyzing samples all of the time that had many, many variables that you had to plot and it was difficult to tease out and to be confident in your results, then you should ask your manager to send you to statistics training and principal component analysis, because that's really the only way to confidently use it. I would not suggest that you just use the Minitab stat guide and think you understand PCA, because I don't, okay? The, I would want to go to training to really learn how to use this tool, not just well, but wisely. When is it ne needed and when is it not needed? Because honestly, if you try to use this and you're not exactly sure in all of the meanings of those things, you're going to get destroyed on the stand. Because <laughs> remember, you have to defend everything that you do. And so you could probably depend, defend a box plot a lot easier <laughs> than the PCA plot. And so stick with the tools that you're most confident in. And if you keep pushing, getting pushed towards PCA, then ask for training and, and become an expert in that. All right, that's all I have. <laughs>